3.16 is a very familiar scripture. We all know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Of course, most of us have heard this before, but sometimes it takes reading a couple of times to unlock more meaning within scripture. Let's read that again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God gave, and not only that, but God gave us his very best. It is God's very nature to give to his children. Not just this, but we can also see that the reason he gave was because he first loved us. For God so loved us that he gave us his son, and he planted his son into this world to receive a harvest of sons and daughters. So the nature of God's giving is rooted in his unconditional love for us. Isn't that good? Now in Ephesians 5, uh, verse 1 to 2, Paul says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ has also loved us, and has given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So God loved the world so much that he gave, and the Apostle Paul tells us, the church, to be imitators of God. And not only that, but also to walk in love, just as Christ had loved us. So today, as we come before his throne of grace and mercy to worship him today on Good Friday, we thank him for everything that he has done for us on the cross. Without the cross, we wouldn't be here. There would have been no church. And today, as we bring our offering to him, we have all the opportunity to imitate God through our love and put that love into action in our giving, just as he did for us. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus is not dead. He is alive in heaven to receive our He is alive in heaven to receive our offering today and to pour out a blessing in our lives. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you gave your one and only Son because you love us. We know that it is your nature to give your children good gifts. And we know that we are to love in the same manner. We bring our gifts to you today, Lord, as an act of love and obedience to you. We believe that you will multiply our seed song today, and we have faith in your word, Lord, that you will, we will receive a mighty harvest from the seeds that are sown. Father, we remember today the pain and the suffering of the cross, and all that Jesus was willing to endure so that we could be set free. He paid the price, such a great sacrifice, to offer us the gift of eternal life. Lord, today we come to your house to honor you and as your gift to us, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. We thank you for what you did on Calvary's cross. Jesus, we thank you for that sacrifice and for taking our sins upon yourself. In faith, we bring forth our very best to you. We believe that you will pour out a hundredfold blessing in our lives. In Jesus' precious name. Praise God. Well, good morning, everybody. I don't know if I heard that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Pastor. Wow, praise God, that sounds better. You sound awake now. <laughs> you sound awake. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Jesus is alive and he's alive forevermore. Amen. You go with me your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 9. And <clears throat> this quickly is just an announcement is that on Sunday, this week Sunday, we will have our Resurrection Sunday service at 8.45 and part of that we will certainly partake of the Lord's table Amen. where we will commune yeah. Amen, have communion together so Sunday will be a communion service on Sunday, that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Oh, this morning, <clears throat> I want to share with you of you being empowered by the blood of Jesus. Can you say that with me? I am empowered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Now, 
you must know that you've probably heard this, but I pray that you will come to the understanding and the conviction of the truth. I will not say fact, I will say truth, because fact is something that needs to be proved, but truth you cannot prove. Amen. Truth is truth. All right? So I pray that you come to that conviction, holy conviction. The blood of Jesus Christ, the blood which Jesus Christ shed for you and I on the cross to ensure our deliverance and our redemption. That blood, the power of that blood is immensely powerful. It's immensely powerful. Without, we cannot separate the blood of Jesus from the gospel. Without the blood, there is no gospel. The gospel is good news. Hence, without the resurrection, there is no gospel. It was necessary that Christ rose from the dead. It was necessary because you find that when they found him after he had risen, he commanded them and said, do not touch him. Do not touch him. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Then he gave a message for them to go and tell the others that he's going to his father and our father. And the purpose of that was to go and present his blood. Remember, that tabernacle made by Moses was a replica of what was in heaven. But Jesus was the high priest. He's our high priest. The old covenant Levite, the Levites, were the priests. The high priest would go beyond the veil once a year on the day of atonement to go present the blood. And the life of the entire nation, the life of the entire nation was at stake. Hence, when the high priest went to present the blood, he had bells tied to his ankles. They were tied with a rope and he would walk. And as long as they heard the bells going through, they would know the high priest is alive and they would know that the sacrifice is acceptable. But if there was sin in the nation, sin in the camp, and they didn't hear the bells, they pulled out the corpse, meaning the sacrifice was not acceptable. And then, for that year, from that moment, for the next year, they suffered. But when that sacrifice was acceptable unto God, the high priest would walk out and everybody would celebrate. Now, we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's why you find, he said, do not touch me. So he had to go and fulfill all things in heaven. Take note, when they entered the tomb, what did they find? What did they find? They found an angel at the foot where he lay and at the head. And the garment with which they buried him wrapped up in the middle. Symbolic and signifying the Ark of the Covenant, the old, the old. So he did away with the old. So that he could fulfill the new. That's why he said, do not touch me. Because you could not touch the high priest at that moment. It was something solemn. So Jesus went and he presented his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. And then when he appears to his disciples, 
And they're afraid. He says, touch me. For a ghost does not have flesh and blood. He mentions the flesh and bone. A ghost does not have flesh and bone. He spoke of flesh and bone. Speak, that's a glorified body. He only speaks of flesh and bone. Why? Where's the blood? The blood of the mercy seat. That's why you can never, you can never omit the blood from the gospel. You can never omit the blood from the church, which is the body of Christ. And I know there are many people going with theories and things like that, but you see why people are deceived. Because there are some people who preach the blood is irrelevant. Let me tell you, without the blood, there is no remission. And the life of all flesh is in the blood. You can never omit the blood. Because remember, that blood speaks of protection. When Israel left Egypt, what did they have to do? Apply the blood on the lintels, on the doorposts. And the destroyer was not welcome there because that blood spoke of covenant. So the minute you take away the blood, there's no covenant. You come out of covenant. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's why I pray that you will understand and be convicted of the truth. That, that blood which was shed for us is immensely powerful. And what Jesus did for us is life changing. Many of us that are seated here this morning have experienced that life changing power of the blood. Each one of us, you, you cannot tell me you, you didn't experience it because the day when you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the day you received you, you connected with that blood. And when you connected with that blood, and you said the sinner's prayer, and you said Amen, all of heaven began to rejoice with you because of your repentance. And you turned from your old and you turned to God. From that moment on, the world as you knew it changed. I remember the day when I received Jesus. I said that prayer. I felt changed on the inside. You feel, you felt how the burden of sin was lifted. You felt it. Because he carried and bore our sin. And when you connected with that, that's why you saw everything, and when you tried to tell people you were born again, they looked at you and said, but you're still the same old, same old. They didn't believe you until they started seeing how your life has changed. The old habits that have passed, the things that have passed, and how glorious now your life has become because of blood. So we've experienced it, that life-changing power of His blood. Four things that every Christian should know about the blood of Jesus. Number one, you should know what the blood of Jesus stands for. You must know what the blood of Jesus stands for. Especially in the day and age that we are living in, brothers and sisters. Especially in the day and age we are living in. There's so much happening in the world. So many things that are happening around us. But when you understand what the blood stands for, those things will not move you. I mean, we used to sing those songs. I'm going to stay right under the blood. I'm going to stay right under the blood. I'm going to stay right under the blood. And the devil can do me no harm, no harm, no harm, no harm, no harm. Number two, you should appreciate it. 
appreciated. Thirdly, you should take advantage of the power it carries. You must take advantage of the power that the blood of Jesus carries. And lastly, you should enjoy all the unlimited blessings his blood carries for all mankind. Not just for you, it's for all mankind. You should enjoy it. Amen. Because, brothers and sisters, it is faith in the blood of Jesus that gives us dominion on the earth. Faith in the blood of Jesus gives us dominion on the earth and it implies and it empowers us to walk in victory over all the power of the enemy. See? Yeah? The blood of Jesus gives you dominion on the earth. And it enables you, it empowers you to walk in victory because because of the blood you have victory. Remember the book of Revelation tells us, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So because of the blood, we have victory. Say amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Understanding, a clear understanding of the power that the blood of Jesus holds is the ultimate key to the kind of abundant life that God desires for each and every one of us to enjoy. That's the key. If you can understand it, if you can understand the power that the blood of Jesus holds, that's the key. Remember, what do you use a key for? To open and lock. Hallelujah. So when you've got that understanding of the power of the blood, that's the key you'll have. Amen? Amen. That life that God desires for all of us to enjoy. You must understand that, yes, we are in a spiritual battle against the devil. We are. We are in a spiritual battle against the devil every day. Every day we are in a spiritual battle against the devil. But it is only knowledge of the advantage that the blood of Jesus has given unto us. Knowledge of those advantages that his blood has given us, that gives us the power and helps us to maintain the victory that Jesus gave us. Do you understand that? Once you know what the blood has done for you, and you know that you are in a battle, but you know that in spite of being in a battle, I have been given the victory. So, if I've been given the victory, it means I need to maintain the victory that was given to me. You understand that? You need to maintain that victory. Because if you do not maintain it, it's like, if I could liken it to your garden at home. If you do not maintain your garden, you'll find weeds. So much so, it will be, you know, in Afrikaans they say, dear Mata. You know what's Brigami? Everything mixed. You won't see, you know, plant from wheat. That's why you've got to maintain it. It's the same with your vehicle. If you do not maintain your car, you cannot expect it to give you or you cannot expect to enjoy the benefits that it's supposed to give you. Hence, the same with the victory that Jesus has given us by his blood. That victory needs to be maintained. How do I maintain it? I've got to grow in knowledge of what his blood has done for me. I've got to grow in understanding of the power that his blood holds concerning me. Say amen to that. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus gives you authority on the earth and secures your future with him in heaven. What? The blood of Jesus 
Tu braço lá na mão do braço só na baixa. Aleluia. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The blood of Jesus gives you authority. Familiar. We will read Revelation chapter 12 shortly. You know, oh God. When you read the book of Job, we find there how the sons of God will come and present themselves to God. We find also the devil will also come among them and come and accuse them. But because of the blood of Jesus, because of the blood, because of the blood, the accuser was cast out. He lost his place in heaven. He cannot stand and accuse you before God anymore. Because the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the power of the blood, the blood spoke with authority, cast him out. Now you and I, we connect with the blood. Because of our connection with the blood, we have authority on the earth. If the blood could cast him out in heaven, you have the blood to come and talk to me. Because of the blood, you have the power to cast him out on earth. That's why you have the power and the authority to use the name of Jesus. And it's not just anybody that can use the name of Jesus. And get them demons running. You remember the sons of Sceva. They tried to also cast out demons in the name of Jesus. That name which Paul was casting out demons by. And we find that when they were casting out, they said, we cast you out in the name of this Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the demons spoke, and what did the demons say? Jesus I know, Paul I know. Who are you? I know Jesus. I know the power of his blood. I know Paul. Paul has identified with that power. And Paul carries that power. Because of that blood, Paul has the authority to use that name. But who are you? Are you getting something, somebody? In Hebrews chapter 9, from verse 11, the Bible says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. Woo. He came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater, watch this, the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is, not of this creation. You see that? Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus has given us authority on the earth and has secured our future with him in heaven. Because that blood speaks in heaven. Hallelujah. That blood speaks of the future that you have with God, that eternal future, because he's given you by his blood eternal redemption. And when Jesus shed his blood, he offered the only sacrifice necessary for all our needs, both now and for all eternity. He offered that sacrifice, the sacrifice of his blood. His blood is the only thing that gives us access to God. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that gives us access to God's presence and all the blessings that God has for us. You see that? Because he identified with us, he shed his blood, it was supposed to be our blood, but instead he gave his blood. Our blood was, was dead. But he took it upon himself to die in our place. 
you exchange places. It's like being in a court. Let's say you're standing in a court and you are supposed to serve life. Can you picture yourself serving a life sentence? And you stand there and the, when the case is going on, they ask you, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? We were all born into sin. Hence, we were all destined for death. So when we would stand before God prior to the blood, we would plead guilty. And the punishment is death and life. Standing there in that cubicle, whilst they're asking you, someone else comes in and says, sorry, Your Honor. Sorry, Your Honor. Ricardo did not do anything. I did. I did. So what happens now? Immediately, all focus is no longer on you. It's on this person. Because now, you are innocent by virtue of this person's confession concerning you. The judge looks at you and says, you may go. You may go, Brother James. You are free, Brother Jeff. Brother Felix, you, you may go. You may step down. You are no longer on trial. You understand? Because he took your place. You've got, you've got it. So that in life, I said we are in a spiritual warfare. Now the devil in heaven, his place was always accusing the brethren. But because of the blood, he was cast out. Amen. That's what I said. He's cast out. Where is he? Cast out to the earth. So as long as you are in the earth, you're in a spiritual warfare. And on the earth, every day you are in a court. Every day you're in a courtroom. Because every day you're feeling guilty. Every day you're condemning yourself. But you need, that's why, you need to stay in the word of God which says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You've got to renew your mind, renew your spirit with the word of God. So that when the devil tries to bring an accusation, you can give him a word. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus showed us when Jesus was being tempted by the devil. Remember, the devil also tried to hold court cases with Jesus. If you are the Son of God. Remember what Jesus said to him. It is written. It is written. Get behind me. Now you have that power. You have that authority. To trample him underfoot. And when he tries to bring up a case against you, come and talk to me, somebody. You can tell him about your glorious future and his doom. The devil can tell him there's no future for you. You can say, well, speak for yourself, because I know about your future. I know about that lake. As for me, I have a place with God. It's a glorious future. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So every time the enemy tries to accuse you in your daily battle, you just stand and you listen, you don't need to plead innocent or guilty, you plead the blood. How do you plead? I plead the blood. Whatever happens in your life, I plead the blood. I plead what the blood has done for me because the Bible tells me everything the blood has done for me. So I plead the blood. You know, listen, in a court case, they say, guilty or not guilty, remember, the blood removed the transgression. The enemy tries to build his case. Lead the blood. The blood did it. Can't build a case. There's no case. Throw that case out. You 
can walk in victory. Come and talk to me, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The devil is defeated by the blood of Jesus, and this is what gives you and I the victory. I want you to write it boldly on your notebook. Write it with capital letters. The devil is defeated by the blood of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus gives me the victory. That's why when you plead the blood, when Israel was applying the blood upon the doorposts and the lentils, they come and talk to me, somebody. Amen. What they were saying is, God has done it. God has spoken. As he has spoken, so let it be. This blood speaks for us. The book of Hosea 4 verse 6, the Bible says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And hence we find that even today, many, many, or shall I say millions of people are held back and are destroyed by what they do not know. People are destroyed by what they do not know. Once you know something, I mean, consider this. I think Pastor Sharon spoke about how Kurt drove into church this morning. Now, there was a time he didn't know how to drive. I mean, he could get in the car and he sees those obstacles and, you know, he see what people do, but he doesn't know how. It's, it's meaningless. And because it's meaningless, if he needed to go somewhere, he had to use NN10 posts. NN10. Amen. He had to go in NN10. <laughs> Two wheels. <laughs> Two feet. But now that he knows the dynamics of it, because listen, which is better? I know walking is healthier. It is healthy to walk. But which is better? Which will get you there quicker? Walking or driving? Driving. Driving, obviously. So now, you see? Because when you walk, when you get to your destination, it's like you had a shower the second time. Come on, somebody. And you tie it. You're out of breath. When you, you, you know, when you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do, you can't even do because you're so drained. But if you drove, you're still full of energy, you're still full of life. So what I'm saying is, what people do not know actually destroys them. Because people do not know the power that the blood carries. They do not know what it means. They do not understand it. They do not appreciate it. Hence, they do not enjoy what the blood has done. You with me? Hallelujah. Because once you know, understand, and apply what the Bible teaches, what God says about the blood of Jesus, then only and only then will you be free from sin, from fear, from deception, from sickness, and every wicked thing that the devil uses against you. Amen. Because you've got to come to the place where you know it, where you understand it, and where you apply it. Until you apply it, it's meaningless. Amen. To have faith in the blood of Jesus is to know what it has accomplished for us. When you have faith in the blood of Jesus, you know what it has accomplished for you. Remember Rahab. Remember Rahab when the two spies came into the city. Rahab's house was built on the wall of that city. That city had walls around it. And you found that there were houses built into that wall. And Rahab's house was built on that wall. And the spies gave her their word. They gave her their oath. They 
said, the day we come, make sure that you put out that scarlet thread. That scarlet thread, that will be the sign. That scarlet thread is the sign. It's a symbol. It, sign it signifies our oath to you. That the God we serve, who made an oath with us, concerning us, that he will protect us, that he will preserve us, that he will be with us. That same God will preserve you. Amen. But when you do so, make sure that all your kinsmen, make sure your family, your mother, your father, your, your, your siblings, every member of your family should be in your house. Because if they are not in your house, they are, we will be guiltless of their blood. Because when that city was taken and those walls gave way, those walls did not fall. Those walls caved in. I imagine this, that whole city, the walls all caved in, except where the house was. That's the only part that stood up. But everything, the house was connected to those walls. But it's a miracle, it's a miracle that a woman that was an outcast not even part of Israel. She became numbered amongst Israel. That even in the language of our Savior Jesus Christ, we find in the Gospel of Matthew, she's named amongst So that blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus speaks on your behalf. The blood of Jesus, come on, when nobody knew about you, you won't be made known because of the blood. The blood gives you an identity. The blood connects you. Hallelujah. Amen. She had faith in that scarlet faith and that preserved. Now, if you have faith in the blood that was shed, are you getting the picture now? Hallelujah. Amen. There are some things you need to know in order to experience the power of the blood of Jesus. Some things you need to know. And I'm going to go through just a few. We will conclude on Sunday. That's why I say we have communion on Sunday when you can understand what that blood. You see, when you're taking that blood, you must understand what that blood has done for you. You must understand what that blood means to you. It's once you understand it that you're able to appreciate it more. That's why when we say have communion in your home, break bread, partake of the Lord's table, when you understand what that blood signifies. It will make so much sense to you. And you'll begin to see things in your life taking shape. Come and talk to me, somebody. Because you need to know it. Otherwise, you'll be like Kurt was when you couldn't drive. You'll be battling. But once you know it, you can apply it. It just starts working. Amen. Amen. Number one, you must know the truth about the life and the grace that the blood of Jesus holds for you. You must know the truth about the life and the grace that the blood of Jesus holds for you. You see, that grace that he holds, it's found in Philippians 4 verse 19. That Paul could say because of the blood, he could say, but my God shall supply all your needs Remember I told you the blood of Jesus has taken care of all our needs, both now and even for all eternity. Like Paul says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Because of the blood. Amen. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Because 
of the shedding of his blood, there is remission. In other words, to put it this way, you, you remember a few months ago, there was a, uh, a pair of, uh, of young kids that were kidnapped. Do you remember that? And everybody was talking about the ransom. You know, because listen, if you are kidnapped, should not, I should not say kidnapped, the word would be hostage. That's the hostage. If you are held hostage, if you are held hostage, normally the person that's holding you hostage would ask for a ransom. Because they would require a sum to be paid. And only upon the receipt of that sum would you be released. Likewise, Satan held humanity hostage. He held humanity bound in sin, sickness, disease. Every wicked thing. Held them bound. There's a ransom because there's a ransom that needs to be paid. There's a price that needs to be paid. And then Jesus, by his blood, paid the price. The devil did not know what was happening. I mean, when they were, you know, accusing Jesus. Remember, Jesus knew. That's why the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him in joy, endured the cross. He endured because of the joy set before him. He saw what the Father, the Father revealed to him his ministry. He knew what his ministry was about. He knew how his ministry would be fulfilled. That when they took him captive, and they brought him before all the religious leaders they took him before Pilate and they built up cases and accusations against him. And they said all si sorts of things towards him. And how when they started beating him, when they slapped him and beat him, that even the hairs, his beard, the hairs on his face were torn. His flesh was torn. And they took a cross of thorns and they placed it on his head. They did all those things. I'm sure the devil must have been thinking, ha, 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 we got you. We're silencing you. Little did he know when he saw Jesus carrying that cross to Jerusalem. For Yah, the Son of God. Now destined to die. But he didn't know that that cross that he was carrying down the Via Dolorosa on the way to Golgotha, as he went through the city, he didn't know that that cross was actually cleansing humanity, cleansing the city. Went down the Via Dolorosa and he got to Golgotha, the place of the skull. Where they crucified him on that cross. They nailed him to that cross. When they pierced his sides. <laughs> when they pierced him, he thought, now it's the end. And when he said, it is finished. He thought, yes indeed it is finished with him. Because I'm still on the earth and I'm controlling the earth. But let him know. When they pierced his side and the water and the blood gushed out, it spoke of newness, spoke of new beginnings, it spoke of a new birth, because something happened. There was darkness on the face of the earth, and then there was an earthquake that even the graves were open. Many who had died in the Lord appeared unto many in the city. And the veil of the temple was torn in two. 
He can have the doing away with the earthly veil because there's another better veil. It's the veil of his body. Amen. When that earthquake took place, Jesus, the Son of God, he went down to the pit of hell to go and release those who are up. And he took the keys, he took back the power, he took back the authority. Hallelujah! That on the third day when they thought they were going to dress up the corpse, and they got there, and they saw that the door was open. And there was nobody there. But there was one who stood by them and spoke unto them. Then they realized, oh, this is Jesus. Hallelujah. And he tells them, do not touch me, because I have not yet ascended unto the Father. But go back to the others and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. Hallelujah. And when it was come and talk to me, it was fulfilled. In heaven he appears to them. And he appears to them. Hallelujah. And then, he, you, know, you understand, he starts opening the scriptures to them, explaining what it was that happened to him. You see, until you know, it makes no sense. So they had to be schooled about what happened in the ministry of the Messiah that walked with them and what his death meant, what his burial meant, what his resurrection meant. He's, he imparted all that to them. Then he told them, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he says, behold, Hallelujah. I give you the keys. I give you the authority. You see, the devil thought when Jesus said it is finished, he thought, yeah, it is finished. But what did he know? It was, the, it was the end of him. It was the end to the torment that humanity had to endure because of him. Because now that blood the ship on that cross has freed humanity. Hallelujah. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Secondly, we must believe all that God says about the blood of Jesus. We must believe all that God says about the blood of Jesus because Matthew 9.29 tells us, according to your faith, be it unto according to your faith. When you understand and you know and you can grasp it and you embed it in your heart and you believe it in all of your heart, it's done unto you according to your faith. Thirdly, I'm going to close with this one. We must appropriate and take possession of the power of the blood. We must appropriate it and take possession of the power of the blood. Because it is our faith, it is our faith that works for us. You see, his blood was shed by the grace of God. But it's your faith in what God says his blood has done for you. Your faith, your faith, your faith actually takes what grace has made available to you. Your faith takes what grace has made available to you. Hallelujah. It's not works. It's not works. It's grace. So what grace has made available, your faith takes what grace has made available to you. And grace, the grace of God is so much. It is so abundant, you cannot measure it. Amen? Amen. So your faith takes what grace has made available to you. Hallelujah. You remember the woman with the issue of blood? You remember that? 
Her faith made her well. She said, if I can just touch. So how about you? I, I, I'm connected to the blood. I'm connected to its power. And I'm going to take possession of what the grace of God has made available to me by the blood. Hallelujah. Let me close the point four. So I'll close the point four. You must expect your miracle. When you connect with the blood, expect your miracle. Because you, come and talk to me. Expectation is the breathing ground for miracles. If there's no expectation, you can never. Unless a woman is expecting, she cannot give birth to a baby. Hence, unless you become expectant, your miracle cannot be birthed. Expectation is the breeding ground for your miracle. Remember Rahab? Rahab had expectation. She looked forward to it. Whilst everybody in the city was speaking about their doom, Rahab knew, no, we will be spared. She looked forward to it. She didn't question and say, oh, how? What if the whole thing is falling? What if they forget about me? What if there was no what ifs? She held on to that word. She put that scarlet thread. She was expected. And then what happened? A miracle birth. Whilst everybody else perished and died, she and her household, those that came under her roof, were all spared. Hence, do you know what that means for you? You've connected with the blood. Your family. Amen. If one be saved, the whole household be saved. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. Stop listening to the people telling you it's not going to happen with your children. They're going to amount to nothing. This is going to happen. They're not Listen, because I am saved. If one be saved, the whole household be saved. Because I enjoy the benefits. The benefits are also for my children and my children's children and their children. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Because of the blood of Jesus, you have every right to expect the word of God to come to pass in your life. The word that God has given you, it is written in blood. The promises that God has made unto you, it's written in blood. Hence, it will come to pass. Do you know if you speak to... You know, forensic detectives and all these people, they'll tell you that at a scene where blood is shed, at the scene where blood is spilt, people can do what they will. Brother James, you're an attorney, you should know this. You can tell me I'm talking nonsense. You can try handy, Andy, you can try what they call a pork paint oil and grease remover. You can try everything and you think, okay, the blood is gone. You've removed it. But you know what? There's a, there's a scanner that they come with and it still detects the blood. It can tell you that there was blood there. Amen. Doesn't matter how long, it doesn't matter how many years have passed, it can still tell you that there was blood there. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away, says the Lord. What I'm trying to tell you is that the word of God is written in blood. It doesn't matter what the enemy may try to bring in your life to cause you to doubt it. I'm here to tell you that word is written in blood. No man can remove what God has said. No man can run me high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, man. I'm preaching good for the grace of God. If you don't believe it, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to preach it. God has said it about me. I don't care what who says. I don't care what who tries to show me. God said it. I believe it.
Because I understand the power of that blood, which was shed for me. When you understand it, you're able to appropriate it. That you'll find. You know what? There was a woman of God who was diagnosed with cancer. Stage 4 cancer. And she began studying about the power of the blood of Jesus. And every day at 4 p.m. she'd go to a specific place in her yard. And she would go there and take communion every day. After three months, she went back. When the doctors tested, there was no cancer. Doctors asked her, how did this happen? She said, the blood that Jesus shed for me removed that sickness. So I say, when you understand, when you understand, you work. Many people that are facing things in their lives, See, there's a thing called generational curse because the genes are defective. But when you come to Jesus, you let go of the generational curse and you connect to what is called the generational blessing. There's also a generational blessing, people. When the genes change. When do the genes change? It's when there's another blood type. It's like when you understand what the blood of Jesus has done, you will not walk in deception. You will not walk in defeat. You will not walk in failure. You will not walk in sickness. You will not walk in torment. But you will live in triumph. You will live in victory. And you will walk in it perpetually. So I pray. That's my prayer to you this day. Is that God will keep you enlightened. That you will have that holy conviction. The power of the blood carries. Hallelujah. Let us stand. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give me more praise. Come on, give me more praise. Thank you for the blood. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. Father, we just thank you this morning for the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, which was shed for us. Thank you, Lord, oh God, because of the blood, because of the word of our testimony, oh God, we have overcome the wicked one. You've given us the victory, oh God. And this Good Friday, Father, we thank you. As millions and millions and millions of your people, Lord God, reflect on what was done for us at Calvary. I pray, Lord, that enlightenment will come, revelation will come. I pray that the bride of Christ, that the church will take her rightful place upon the earth, O oh God. That we will bear fruit unto you, O oh God. That all men, O oh Lord God, shall give you praise. That all men, women, young and old, O oh God, every nation and every tribe that they will come to know the saving power of the grace of God revealed to us through the cross. We all, oh Lord God, will partake of the power that the blood of Jesus has made available unto us. And now, oh Lord God, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ of death, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit Rest and abide with each and every one of us, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord preserve you. The 
Lord prosper you. And until we meet again, in Jesus' name, go forth to love, to serve the Lord and his people. In Jesus' name, God's people say, Amen, Amen.